Hi everyone. This is our second um, talk about prayer at our Stay at Home and Pray series. And this one is on Lexio Divina. I'm looking at my screen. It's backwards in my screen. I hope it's not backwards for all of you. But here's my little visual aid for us here today as we go through all this. But let me say as I begin that I'm just so very, very sorry that you're not able to come to church to uh, uh, have the Eucharist and uh, that this is a real fast for all of us. And um, it breaks my heart, but it is really important that we uh, isolate ourselves to quarantine ourselves these days so that we don't contaminate others. That's the important thing. Not so much about ourselves, but let's not contaminate others. And I, I think about uh, the Amazon Synod whenever people are saying that in certain places, the Amazon Catholics don't get a chance to see a priest for maybe six months at a time. How difficult that must be going on and on and on. Hopefully nothing like that will happen to all of us. So today, we're going to talk about really praying. You have your prayer space, Liturgy of the Hours, which we can all do together to pray together. And now this idea of Lexio Divina, which is Latin for sacred reading. This is real prayer. As a matter of fact, I would say that all prayer on some level, even the rosary itself, is a form of Lexio. So I'm going to wait for a minute while you grab your Bible, so go do that, and I'll tell a story in the meantime to those who already have one with them. So go ahead, um, go get your Bible. Why are you still sitting there? Go get your Bible, go on. And here's my story. One day, and I'm waiting until people come back, um, Tom Brady died, went to heaven, and uh, so he goes to heaven, he meets St. Peter, and, and St. Peter uh, says, well, Tom, glad you're here. You finally made it. You're a great football player. And here's your spot in heaven. And he points this little cottage, has a New England Patriots uh, a flag above it. I, I, I'm, I know whenever Tom Brady gets in the Hall of Fame, it'll be New England Patriots somehow. No, not Tampa Bay Buck. But um, so it's a, it's a little cottage, has a flag of the New England Patriots above it, and he sees the cottage, it's kind of humble, you know, and he looks over in a, a little across the street and there's this big, huge mansion, huge, biggest mansion Tom Brady ever saw in his entire life. And above the mansion is flying, flying the Steeler flag. And he goes to St. Peter and he says, St. Peter, I'm Tom Brady. Why do I have to stay in this little cottage when Ben Roethlisberger has, gets to live in his big, humongous mansion, it's huge, with a Steeler flag flying above it. Why is it that way? And St. Peter says, oh, that's not Ben Roethlisberger's home. That's God's home. Okay, you're back. So, you have your Bible. Could you join me uh, in the Gospel of Mark? Turn there. Chapter 10, verse 46. And we're going to do a little Lexio. I'm going to talk about Lexio, talk about all these four steps as it re, re, uh, uh, um, um, or the four different steps on the ladder of Lexio Divina. Now, let me say one thing about method. This is a method of prayer. It's a very important method of prayer. But it's only a method. So you can't be too strict about this. You have to be sort of open-ended about this. And it's almost like we wander around these four different read, reflect, respond, rest. If we get too rigid with the method, we miss the encounter. All this is about meeting God, an encounter with God. It isn't so much just about getting the method right, getting something right. It's about experiencing a person. And all this is about us experiencing God through his word, through his Bible, which I think all of you have your Bible right now. So that's what this is all about. So the first thing you do, and by the way, let me, let me say, and I'll kind of throw these things in there as we talk about all this. I would say you should do this for maybe 
15 minutes at a time. If you could do it twice a day, that would be awesome. But 15 minutes a day at least with your Bible. And I would recommend you do the Bible readings of the day that we're using for our Liturgy of the Word. They should be on our website in our bulletin. If they're not easy to find, I will make sure tomorrow when we have our virtual staff meeting together that we make sure we make the readings for the day very, very easy for you to find. And that's what I think you should do your lecture with the gospel of that day. So let me choose this particular gospel, the blind Bartimaeus. And the first thing you do is read the text. Now in your Bible, in my Bible, there is commentary in the columns on the right-hand side. I would include that in your reading. You want to know what the author intended to say to us. Not what we think, but what the author intended. That's the meaning of this first part. Let's get to know the meaning of the text. And this text is occurring at the end of a whole series of times in Mark's Gospel where Jesus is trying to get the, the disciples to understand who he is and that he's going to die upon a cross and things are going to get pretty nasty when things get to Jerusalem. So that's basically what he's trying to do right here. And so this is the end of that part. And he thinks, Mark does, that Bartimaeus is the ultimate disciple. So the first thing you do is you read the text and you read it again. And you make sure that you really, really know the text. And this could take, as you begin Lexio, maybe the first 10 minutes of the whole process. You don't have to finish all of these things. You don't have to get to all of these things. There's just four different steps on this ladder that we go up and down this ladder all the time. Let me read the text to you. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be quiet. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. As they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, he's calling you. He throws aside his cloak, sprang up, came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. Now, if there's commentary on the right-hand side of your Bible, I would also read that as well. And there is commentary here in this Bible. It actually tells me to go to a note in Matthew chapter 9, which I would do. But then read the text again and make sure you really know what's there. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, on Sunday, I mentioned that the Samaritan woman left her water jar. She was so struck by Jesus to tell the people in her village about Jesus. This blind man throws off his cloak, which means, and there's, I, 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 there's maybe one thing more important than your water jar, that's your cloak. And so he leaves that behind because Jesus is calling him. So same kind of idea, same kind of a dynamic there. So you read the text, and you know the text over and over again. That might take quite a while, at least at first. After a while, a lot less time. Then we reflect. And by the way, these first two, read and reflect, these are all kind of intellectual things. These are cognitive things here. I begin to reflect on the text. I want to mention two ways of reflecting on the text. Number one, pick a word out. And what is that word? Why did that word strike you? Why was it important? Get up. He's calling you. Or more importantly, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I want to see. I want to see. Do we really want to see? I mean, ponder that word. What does that word mean? That's one way. We think of a word from the text. He's calling you. He throws aside his cloak. Whatever way you want to say it, any of those things. I ponder that, what that means to me. The second way I can reflect, the second part here, is I can use my imagination. I can imagine I'm in the text. Maybe I'm in the crowd. 
Maybe I'm way back in the back of the crowd. Why am I so far back in the crowd? Maybe I'm Bartimaeus. Maybe I'm the blind person. Maybe I'm in the crowd, but I'm real close to Jesus. Maybe some of you don't want to be Jesus. I don't know. But I let's imagine I'm in the crowd. I see it. I smell it. I, I, I uh, touch it. I can taste it. Um, I'm there. I can almost, I can imagine myself being there. I imagine where Jesus is, where he looks like. Imagine what Bartimaeus looks like. I use my imagination. Beautiful. Good way to reflect on the text. And as you reflect on the text, why are you Bartimaeus? Why are you one of the crowd? Why are you in the back of the crowd observing everything going on? Why aren't you closer to Jesus? You know, whatever way you want to say that. So I read the text. I reflect on it. Now, as I reflect on it, I might go back up and read again. It doesn't matter. I go back and forth. I can go back and forth between these two. Now, these two here, again, are the two that are about our intellect or the cognitive aspect of us. And we have not really begun to pray yet. But these are important. You've got to have them. You cannot love who you do not know. So we have to know the Bible. We have to know God. Jerome says, ignorance of Scripture, ignorance of Christ. We must know our Bibles. We must read our Bibles. So what time better to read our Bibles and do it now? We really need to do all that. And then, once we read, once we reflect, automatically, if we come to these two points, this we are going to respond. This now becomes a matter of my heart. I respond. How do you feel about all this? What's my heart saying? What, what words do I get an echo in my heart about all of this? And, 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 and in my imagination, I'm just sort of pouring myself out. Oh, why am I in the back? Of the, uh, why am I right beside Jesus? Why am I Bartimaeus? Dear God, I want to see. And, and this, this gets an echo inside of me, and I begin to respond. And now I'm praying from my heart. I'm engaging Jesus and maybe even asking him questions. Jesus, why do I feel so blind? What's the meaning of all this? What's the meaning of all this we're going through right now and going to continue to go through right now? What's all this mean for us? And I begin to really pray, to really pray. And this is the dialogue part of prayer. And many people say that when they pray, they talk back and forth with God. This is the dialogue part. But here, I, one thing I would say to you is do a lot of listening in that dialogue as opposed to all the talking. So I begin to respond. I I feel something. I have an engagement with a person here. I'm not just thinking about all this in my head. I'm engaging with a person. If I get that far, that's pretty good in this whole idea of Lexio. That's pretty good in 15 minutes and 20 minutes or whatever. We don't take, we take our time. Go up and down the ladder. After respond, you want to go read again. And, and then once you read it again, you get all kind of fired up again and go back to response or maybe reflect a little bit more and you come back up here and read against. You're wandering all around this until finally at the end, you maybe pick a word or a phrase and you just simply say it gently, as one person put it, as gently as a feather falling on a piece of cotton. That's <laughs> pretty gentle. I rest. And I just gently say the words over and over again, Son of David, have pity on me. Or, or he followed him on the way, on the way, on the way. And I let myself deep inside rest where God dwells. God dwells here. We talk about the Eucharist. I can't receive the Eucharist. That's true. That's all very, very true. But at the same time, he dwells here. If I can't receive the Eucharist now in church, I can, I can receive him now right here, deep inside of me. I can rest deep inside my own heart. And, and, and if, as I rest for a few moments, and all of a sudden I might get distracted, well, maybe I go back up to read a little bit more. Then I come back down to rest a little bit. And I go back up and down the ladder. And this is my prayer. And this is really powerful. And let me just simply add, once you're done with all this, what you could do is reflect on what happened. If you were doing a Jesuit retreat, and you were doing this for, say, 20 minutes a day. Actually, they would ask you to do it for an hour. Four times a day for an hour. You would sit and you'd do this. 
And then you'd write what the experience was. And in that writing of the experience, you go to your spiritual director and he would uh, uh, talk to you about what is going on. And God speaks. God speaks. I promise you, if you do this every day, God will speak to you. That's Lexio Divina. That's this most profound way of praying that I know. As a matter of fact, I would say on some of all prayer is this. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the rosary one time, we're going to talk about how the rosary is really a form of lexio, of doing this, this prayer here. Uh, uh, and, and of course, the, the rosary is very much biblical, and we're praying with the Bible. We've got to get to know the Bible, and this is how not we read the Bible, we pray with the Bible. It's lexio divina. So, God bless all of you. We're going to talk some more as things unfold. We have a couple things going on. Uh, we'll be in touch with you with some more ways of, of, of dialoguing with one another and being in contact with each other. God bless all of you. And let me pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, bless us as we go through these very stressful times, very difficult times, challenging times for us. Help us to get ever, ever closer to you and transform us into a people of prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.